I'll hand you over to Craig. Okay. So, um, I'm going to set up while I talk, uh, which is not how I usually do it, but... Okay. start a new game and I'll talk while it's running in the background. Actually, let's create a new one. Okay, so very sorry that this is a bit of a rush setup. Um, I literally found out I was doing my talk an hour earlier than I expected, but um, it's quite a full audience. Okay, so uh, I'm Craig Richardson. I'm currently a trainee computer teacher and I've also written a book on Minecraft programming for Raspberry Pi. Um, going back a bit, when I was a student at school, I really wanted to make my own video games. Um, the idea that um, the, the creative freedom and the kind of the excitement that surrounded making video games when you're a small child really is a massive incentive for learning programming. To learn to program, however. At the time, I couldn't find resources which were accessible, um, and I couldn't find resources which were kind of suited to the needs of a 14-year-old boy. So, following that, we now have the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, we've also got a version of Minecraft, uh, which is one of the most popular games in the world at the minute, uh, which is specifically designed for the Raspberry Pi. So this version um, is different from regular Minecraft, in that you can program it with Python. So that gives you gives children and adults, surprisingly, um, the incentive to learn Python in order to manipulate the Minecraft game world. So effectively what you've got is a familiar game which is so popular that even my parents know about it. And you can use programming to visually see what the program does in the world. So, um, let's think, let's go to demos now. So, going back to Python. So, with Python you've got a number of uh, key constructs which exist in most programming languages. Um, with those key constructs we can uh, build very basic or very complex um, games or programs on top of Minecraft. So for example, the very first one I usually try and show is uh, Teleport. 
So if I just open up the teleport file. It's not oh, it's in the game. Uh, <laughs> it's a slight technical error. Okay, I'll do it. So, it's not tapping out. I'm trapped, yes, I am actually trapped in the game. Uh, yeah, this is not... Control-Alt-F4? Control-Alt-F4? Do Control-Alt-Delete? No, it's not doing it. Escape menu. Escape? <laughs> Control-Alt-Tab? Control Alt-F4? Alt this, this is actually the first time it's happened. What I'm going to do instead is unplug it and plug it back in. <laughs> okay, so slight technical hitch. So I'll, I'll quickly go over the theory behind it before we go in. So, um, Minecraft Pi Edition has something called an API, which allows you to plug Python programs directly into it without kind of changing the basic game, but allowing you to kind of manipulate the game world. So one of the most basic ones in there is a uh, command to teleport to change the position of the player. So the program, when I get this back up, is just very simple. It can be written, I think, about uh, five or six lines of code. And it just um, it teleports the player to a new position. And through this, you can learn uh, the Python um, syntax for variables. So you can say, x is equal to 10, y is equal to 11, z is equal to 12, or any other numbers. So that's very basic, and it shows you how to do something quite, uh, which can be quite abstract to a lot of students, something quite abstract, but it puts it in a physical, um, physical way. Uh, just get the right world up, this, those other worlds. I will show you maybe a bit later because they're uh, slightly modified. Uh, okay, so we've got the world up again. And let's wait for this to load. Um, let's see documents. Um, and then it's. I'm actually a teacher at full time at the minute, and little hitches like this would have set the room off. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for being quiet. <laughs> yes, if, if I was showing the kids Minecraft, literally, I've been doing some after school classes on it. I don't even have Raspberry Pis, I don't even have the software on my computers. I've been showing them the code, literally on bits of paper, and they've been reading it. And that's, that's uh, you don't even get that in most subjects, but you literally just told these kids to read this because it said Minecraft on the paper. And they, they pick it up, and it's, it's uh, such a cool feeling. So, if you can see this, right at the top of the screen, in the top from my perspective, top right hand corner, it says position 53.7, 7, minus 30. So what we've got here is a program which is written in Python. Uh, I'm going to make that the biggest view. Um, edit, preferences, and oh god, this is. I'll make that the bigger. Okay. Scroll down. Oh, scroll down, that would help. Okay, I'll just rearrange this slightly so it's uh, not just my next one. So, so, yeah, um, Tom, Tom Hartley is supposed to be here. Uh, it's actually quite a good speaker as well. Um, if, you, if you see him, ask him about his bicycle. He's going to talk about AirPi, but he's also got a bicycle 
which I saw him ride on the stage once, and it's quite it's quite impressive. It's quite loose, but uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, if you look at this program, the first two lines are used in every Minecraft Python program you need. It pretty much just says um, connect to the Minecraft game. So every program I show always has these two lines. It's not necessary to understand it for a beginner, but it's just one of those things you kind of have to have to do in order to get it to work. And then the most important part of this program, if we're going to be using it as a teaching resource, is the X, Y, and Z. Those are called variables in Python. They effectively just store a value into those uh, into those variables. So X is a variable, stores a value of 10. Y is a variable, stores a value of 11. Z is a value, variable, stores a value of 12. And then the last line, all it does is say to my say to Minecraft game, move the player to those that position. So I'll move the player to position 10, 11, 12. Okay, so going back over this, I'm going to just do Python teleport.py. And if you look at the game, when I press enter, if we're in luck, it should move to position 10, 11, 12. Okay, so three, two, one. So very simply, teleports the player. I think we actually might be trapped in the tree. <laughs> oh, no, look. Good. So, there's something different with this one. Um, ignore that pig in the distance. That doesn't usually exist there. Also. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that's a very basic one. So that's um, just showing variables. So it's something which can be quite abstract and it's showing it in a very concrete, very visual way. So now when we go back, the next program I'm going to show you is, I think, flowers.py. So we've got another thing in Python called a loop, which uh, I'll show you the code for that. Oh, look at this day. Okay, so looking at this code again, the first two, actually the first and third line connect to the Minecraft game, so every program, as I said, that we connect to has those two lines. We've also used time, which is just a way of using time in the thing, and in this case it'll just wait for 0.1 seconds. So what this program does is, as the player walks around the, the game, it creates a path of flowers behind them. So this is quite cool because it's, uh, it shows students how to use something called loops. So if you look at the line which says while true, it, that pretty much creates something called an infinite loop, which will constantly run over and over and over again until the pie dies or the, uh, the person terminates the program. So when I run this one, what it does is it finds the position of the player, and then at the position that the player is at, it'll place a flower, um, and that will just constantly run over and over again. So we do python flower.py. Now, if we go take control of the game world, hopefully it'll let me out this time. Good, it will. Uh, so if you look down, flower stuff up here. And I'm going to run across here. Ignore these pigs, they don't usually exist. I did something weird to it earlier. So if you can look, there's a trail of flowers behind me. And as I run around, more flowers appear. And if I fly in the air, flowers just start flying everywhere. <laughs> so, that's quite cool. Um, at the minute we're in something called creative mode. Um, I might show you a top secret. Um, the version which allows you to actually have health and fight things and have pigs which are sort of appeared in the game. So I'm just going to terminate that and that should stop the uh, oh, there we go. So let's see what else I can do. Okay, so I've demonstrated uh, flowers, I've demonstrated <coughs> teleport. Um, I'm gonna do Midas. Midas is quite a good one. It's it's actually the original version of um, the original version of the flowers. 
Okay, so this is very similar to the last program that we had. So in the last program, as the player walked around, it set, created a trail of flowers behind them. What this one does, instead of creating a trail of flowers behind them, it creates gold blocks below the player. So as they walk around, it just leaves a trail of gold blocks. So this is kind of based on the, uh, the tale of King Midas, who everything he touched turned to gold. So it's quite easy to explain based on that. So I'm just going if you notice, I put a comment in red where it says TNT equals 46. What I like to do is um, give students the opportunity to expand the programs or change them so that they can make them kind of more of their own. And one thing I found with this particular one is students really like to um, add TNT to their games because it's uh, blowing things up is actually one of the most fun things you can do in Minecraft. Um, and the benefit of TNT in this particular version is that you can only access the explosive version of it through Python. So it's a massive incentive to learn Python because you can't ex uh, access the explosives without it. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to skip the bit where I show you changing the gold and I'm just going to change it straight away to TNT. <laughs> actually it might already do this. Yeah, it actually already does that. I haven't changed it since last time I demoed this. Um, so if I do Python, and then uh, Midas. Okay. So when we go back to the game world, if we look down, we've got TNT below us. So as I run along, oh, one other thing which exists in this program which doesn't exist in the flowers one, if you walk in the water, if you go up in the air, because I've used something called an if statement. It won't create blocks if you're in the air, it won't create blocks if you're uh, in water. So that's another kind of way of just kind of using something quite uh, concrete and solid to teach something which is usually quite abstract. So it pretty much says, if, if, they're, if they're not in the air, if they're not um, in the water, create a TNT. So if we fly around, if we walk around for a bit, I'm not going to do it too much, otherwise my pipe's going to crash because it is quite intensive for the processor. So I'm going to switch that off and if I go back in the game. I start hitting TNT. It's now explosive. It's not me, and I'm going to get a good way away from it. So I was at. Um, I was doing a workshop uh, last summer with uh, a room full of about 50 children and they, uh, I showed them a few of my programs, one of them created a house of melons and they got me to change it onto TNT and then fill it with lava and it, the processor was quite, is quite sometimes a bit strained by Minecraft on the Pi but once you um, add TNT to it, it just kind of makes it spike just overwhelms the processor and uh, they, they've literally just covered the entire world with TNT and we just stood there for about a minute while absolutely nothing happened um, which was quite a good opportunity to change, uh, teach them about how the processor works <laughs> so yeah so very basic programs so with only a few lines of code you can actually achieve something which is quite large um, because you're already using the Minecraft game using something which is familiar, something which already has quite a lot built into it. Um, at the minute, the version on uh, the Raspberry Pi is free, so anyone can access it, anyone can start a program uh, using um, Minecraft. There are uh, a few things which are left out from the, from the Pi version, which are so there's things which, are in the, which aren't in the Pi version, which are in the main one. Um, so the students tend to not get as distracted by hunting for dragons and stuff like that. So it's, it's a bit limited, but there is actually a mod, which I've managed to find a couple of weeks ago, which I'm going to briefly <coughs> show you, which I tested on the train. So normally you don't, get to, you, don't have a, you don't have health, you don't have pigs, you don't have monsters in the game. But I managed to find a mod a couple of weeks ago, which I'm going to post about on my blog in a few days, um, which allows you to um, pretty much change it from creative mode, where it's, you're able to fly, where you're able to um, 
just create things into this thing by survival mode where there's cows, there's pigs, there's uh, the way of getting it so it's day and night time. So it works exactly like the normal version of Minecraft would on your mobile phone. So it's quite a cool, cool way of doing that. And on top of this, you can play multiplayer. So you can join several of your friends onto your game as well. You could mod it so that you've got little mini games. For example, uh, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is a little um, dungeon crawler where a team of people go through a dungeon and fight off monsters. So using Python, you can build that on top of it. So it's quite cool to have the pre-made Minecraft game and then modifying it through your Python code. Um, just a couple of things to finish off. Um, I've written an entire book on this. Uh, I will get the link up on board in a second. Uh, it was originally there. Uh, my website is argbox.wordpress.com. So that's A R G H B O X.wordpress.com. On there, I've got a 250 page free PDF book which teaches Python through Minecraft. Um, at the minute, I'm in talks with some publishers to actually get a physical print copy of that, um, which is in the pipeline. And there's also some smaller recipe cards which are kind of more suitable for workshops and classrooms which are also in the pipeline. Um, they follow similar things to what I've shown you today, so they teach the kind of principles of programming through Minecraft. Okay, so um, any questions? One at the back. What was the website? Again? What was the website? <laughs> I'll get the link up on the computer. It's A R G H B O X. Um, let me see if I find my file browser. So, I don't know. Okay, so that's the. Website, that's my Twitter handle. Next question. What, what's from your experience the best sort of starting age to do that? Because Python may not be the easiest language, but of course, um, sure we can learn a lot. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, the early stage. Um, generally, I mean, the age that I'm currently teaching the students, some of them get it, some of them don't. So that's about. 14, 15. So it's it's not really dependent on their age, it's dependent on how enthusiastic they are, how um, motivated they are to actually solve the problems, understand it. I mean, it might be some quite young children who are able to get it, but probably, uh, I think one of the people, one of the youngest person who's contacted, well, the youngest parent, the, the parent with the youngest child who's contacted me uh, was about eight years old. So. I think that's that's probably uh, a good time to start. A lot of ten-year-olds, uh, parents with ten-year-olds, are contacting the same thing with their parents. Uh, oh yeah, that's another point. A lot of people who contact me who've used the book have uh, it's been it hasn't been teachers, it's been parents who have been sitting down with their children, maybe once or twice a week, just having some family time, learning how to program together, which I thought was actually quite cool. It's it's one of those things I didn't expect when I wrote this. I assumed it would be used in uh, classrooms, actually I said maybe it would be used in classrooms, I'm not sure how it, well it was going to be received. Um, but it's been really well received and a lot of parents have been using it with children and it's been quite cool. Uh, next question? Do you know where you got the mod from? Know where I got the mod from? I'm going to post that on my blog I think next week. So um, I mentioned it on Twitter um, and a few people have tried it out. Um, but I'm going to post that on my blog so just I'll look at that in a week or so. Okay. It should be on the website then. Uh, next question? How well does the script work with multiplayer? Oh, um, yes. The scripts can be a bit buggy with multiplayer. Um, for example, when you place a block normally in one game, it doesn't necessarily show up on the other game. But there are ways around that. Um, it takes a few, like one or two extra lines of code. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, the students I've been teaching at Minute, the, the reason they play Minecraft is for the multiplayer. They uh, managed to build a massive castle in about a week with a working tram line, 
they've modelled it after the, under, uh, the underground in London because that's where they live, so it's quite a cool way of doing it. So, yeah, to answer the question precisely, multiply is a bit buggy, but it's something that I'm going to try and get to Mojang to work on, but it is possible to use it. Uh, any other questions? Consumers. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I've been Craig Richardson, and uh, hope to see you again.